Welcome to What the Up is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. In partnership with Friends of Latin America and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast every Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. On August 5th, Mexico's President Manuel López Obrador announced that Mexico will host talks between representatives of Venezuela's elected government and members of the Venezuelan opposition in its capital this month with Norway serving as mediator. It has been proposed that Mexico be the place to carry out these negotiations and we accept it because what we are looking for is that there is dialogue and agreements between both parties. It's talks between the government of Venezuela and the opposition. Hopefully an agreement will be reached, Lopez Obrador said at a press conference. Although he declined to say exactly when the talks will take place, they are expected to begin on August 13. In July, Venezuela President Nicolas Maduro announced that he was willing to start a dialogue between the government and the opposition with National Assembly President Jorge Rodriguez and Hector Rodriguez, governor of the state of Miranda, representing him in the meeting. The mediation will be headed held ahead of regional and local elections in Venezuela on November 21. This follows failed negotiation attempts in 2019 that were held in Norway and Barbados. Joining us today to discuss this important event for Latin America politics and regional relations is Diego Siquiera of Mission Verdad. Diego is a writer, journalist, political analysis and researcher, as well as the co-founder for Mission Verdad, Mission of Truth. Diego is also a fellow with the Samuel Robinson Institute. Both organizations are based in Caracas, Venezuela. You can find Mission Verdad online at Mission Verdad, and let me spell that for you, M-I-S-I-O-N-V-E-R-D-A-D.com. Welcome, Diego. A pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Terry. Thanks for, thank you for having me. My pleasure. So let's start uh, our conversation with uh, the history of Venezuelan negotiations with with the opposition, or specifically the elected governments, uh, uh, the elected government of Nicolas Maduro, and previous dialogue attempts with the opposition of Venezuela. Who is the opposition participating? In, um, in this dialogue and in the past, and, um, and what do we know going, going into this week? Well, you know, the most important thing is that this is, of course, we can have like a framework with starting with the Guaido cycle and then, then before the Guaido cycle, and then we can have, we can, we can have now this moment, which is, I don't know if it's like the maybe the tail end of the way of this way those cycle if we can call it that way these dialogues since 2019 have been sponsored uh, basically by the norwegian government and, 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 and as you all said one in, in 2019 was also held in barbados and this time well we have a different and very interesting initiative on, on a very different regional configuration that that could it seems kind of promising, you know, uh, less dialogues didn't uh, come to reach a, 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 a clear agreement to, where, how, to how to move forward. It was also a different context back then. So now I think it's the, the correlation of power and strength is different and, but not the will of the government. Let me say that, Terry, because within the Guaido cycle or before, because this is not the first dialogue uh, President Nicolas Maduro has ever had with the opposition, uh, have been willing to negotiate and to talk about, to find a way to build some sort, it's not, you know, it's not to give away anything, but it's like to reconcile and, 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 and bring the politics back to the, to the center of the framework. Because you know we've been going through such crazy experiments in the past that aren't exactly political. They're just like you know laboratory operations that try to 
withdraw, try to kidnap sovereignties, independence, and and the capability to make choices, to make proper choices, to find uh, a way to move move forward, basically. And um, last time, like I told you, that, uh, also led by Jorge Rodriguez, which is a very seasoned negotiator. Uh, at some point, they, they were just uh, disrupted, and they, they were usually been in each and every time they've been disrupted by foreign pressure. And it also another thing you might add and you might take into consideration. Yes. Oh, I'm so. I, am I correct in remembering talking about foreign interference? A phone call from Rex, Rex Tillerson from Colombia to Barbados. Yeah, I mean overtly telling the opposition parties participating in the dialogue then. This was in 2019, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes, and not only that- Basically sabotage the conversation. And, and that, that, that has happened before, you know, before this cycle. I mean, I'm talking about 2016, it also happened. It happened also with the EU. Some shady, uh, heavy phone call for some, from somewhere, actually, you know, it, it brings everything to a halt. It happened, I know for a fact, and this is an, an insider comment that happened back in 2016 with the EU, which as you well know, it's actually the, the, the real US backyard in this case. And usually they don't, they don't take this, you know, they, do, they don't make this independent decisions about all this. And, um, or at least they show, they, 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 they show themselves as doing it, but it reaches to some critical point where that, dark, unexpected phone call gets in and everything grounds to a halt. But now things are a bit different because you know something, out, we still have to make, make sure of what, what is gonna be the composition of the, of the other side. Uh, I mean, from the, and also El Presidente Nicolás has always talked in plural about the opposition, it's not the opposition. I think that's a very important element yes. because we, as you well know, uh, since last year in the, in the new recovered sovereign national assembly, there is an opposition that has gone through the process, through the democratic legal process of being elected and to be part of parliament and to be part of discussions and debates and propose ideas and, there, and, and also, to all, which is even more important, which is of the essence, to have a position about sanctions about coercive, coercive uh, unilateral measures against Venezuela and to, and to even be sanctioned themselves. Some of them have, you know, part of the former, uh, the part that split it from the Guaido uh, consensus in, in the previous National Assembly, some of them actors like Jose Brito, for example, they were, uh, and Parra also, they were sanctioned. They, as opposition politicians, they were sanctioned. And I'm talking about people that are not actually complying with everything the government says, that are not following the line so quite easily, and that they're not going their, their way uncritically. They're actually saying what they need to say, and they're being quite frank about what they think should be done. And it's not the same thing as the government believes it should be done. So this will be, of course, some sort of, I guess, it's, it's, it's easily to expect that that would be a, a very important red line. And also let's, from let's yeah. talk about before we go on with um, sanctions and how different sec segments of the um, Venezuelan population and political composition are, interpret sanctions and respond to them. For our audience, I think it's really important uh, for us to explain because I don't think this is known as much as in the United States as it should be that the Venezuelan opposition is more than just the Guaido factor recognized by the United States. There are many other opposition parties, many other opposition participants. I can personally say uh, I was in Venezuela in December for the mm -hmm. National Assembly elections, December of 2020. And we met the night before the elections on Sunday the 6th. So it uh, was the 5th. Our delegation met with members of the opposition, members of the opposition who were participants, and there was a number of, I think there were 14 or 16 uh, 
people in the representing various factions in the opposition and all of them were there because they have chosen to participate in the political process. They believe in the Venezuelan constitution. They, they do want a, a different government and a different economic uh, structure, but they believe that those in the democratic process, they were very overt that they were welcome to participate in the political process. There was no problem forming political parties, registering those parties to participate. They have a different view of, the, yeah. of Venezuela, but they feel that the change needs to come through the electoral process, the political process and the constitutional process, which all of them believe in. They do not mm -hmm. believe in changing the government violently as the Guaido factor does. The, the Guaido, and the Guaido faction is supported by the United States. These other people, we never hear about in the United States. And they're Indeed. the majority. And they believe in the political process. They even went so far as to say that President Maduro was very open. Uh, and this, so this was in December, saying that um, very open to re-engaging the opposition and including them in the political process and attempting to find in very overt in attempting to find ways to pull the opposition, you know, more fully into the political process, which perhaps is what is going to happen this week in Mexico City. Well, hopefully, and indeed, that's one thing you have. Bear in mind, usually they call the main fraction with Guaido another the G4. You know, that's Primero Justicia, Voluntad Popular, which is Juan Guaido and Leopoldo Lopez party. Uh, which one, the Union Un Nuevo Tiempo would be the other one, and Acción Democrática. Those are the four, the G4, the main, the main parties. Uh, but you also have Avanzada Progresista, you also have Soluciones para Venezuela, which is an evangelical one. You have several new parties also there, but also you have the, these, all these parties, as well, except for, for Voluntad Popular, the Guaidó party, they're usually, they're split. They don't have, they don't share the same, uh, position about what to do with the government. Some of them basically acknowledged that the regime change way didn't work. Uh, they actually lost a lot of political capital and credibility uh, among them, their people and among, and among a lot of people that are actually just tired of politics in general. And that's not a healthy sign, if, if you ask me. Uh, but they now acknowledge it. And some of them, you know, part of the discussion in Venezuela now, it's if the whole faction, the whole fractions of the one party, like Action Democratic, will actually participate in the regional elections coming now in November, at the end of November. Yeah, I think it's 21. Uh, so it's also something that is in progress. You also had something from the reason that you might know, Terry, from the from last year, which was almost Capriles, Enrique Capriles Radonsky from Primero Justicia Party, former governor of, of Miranda and two times presidential loser against Nicolás Maduro, that was making his mind, at the end he didn't, but he was actually looking at for, for the European support to be part, to, to, to participate the in the, in the elections. At the end, he didn't because he's not a stupid person, but he's not a brave person either. So he, he didn't have like the spine to, you know, he could have made, he, he could have been even a game changer in, in the opposition politics if he would have participated back then. But like I said, he's not going to take the risk without some sort of Western backup. Even though, you know, this dialogue, this context of Part of real politics with opposition is also been, been you know, it, it's been endorsed by almost all the world, you know, each and every country, it, it, except from, yeah, the US, Canada, some Latin American countries, which have, of course, a very US aligned government, and some of them that now have changed a lot, and some European countries, and some, and even the, in, inside the EU, it, you don't have like a consensus. You have several countries that smile at the process and then they've been pushed by their own, by the EU structure to hold back and to keep the line with the US. But um, 
So it's something that we have to see. And also we have to see what sort of commitments, what sort of agreements would come out of this. And if that's gonna be enough, at least for the EU, and it's not a matter of recognition by itself because we don't need that. And actually, if you have uh, over 120 countries that actually recognize the constitutionally elected government, and they also recognize the legal political opposition, it's not, you know, it's not necessary by principle, but you also have to like ease the tension, diffuse the tension. And also this, well, funny enough, it, it also shows how foreignly driven this also is including some parties that may be not on the crazy regime change bandwagon right now but they don't make their minds they don't grow a spine no. it's something that we might maybe and i would look i'll be very happy if it happens and i really look forward to it and maybe it's something that the that, that Jorge Rodriguez and Nectar Rodriguez would have in mind from the ideas of, of President Nicolás would be actually to bring these people into the fold. It's interesting to me, fascinating, and, and I'm also I, on, a, on a personal level for all of you who I love in Venezuela, it's pretty exciting what is going to happen in, in Mexico this week. And, and the timing of it is really wonderful or is maybe a better word would be uh there's a in my interpretation there's there's a a moment here to be grasped the composition of latin america is mm -hmm. different than it was in 2019 we have yes, the return of absolutely. the mas party in bolivia we have the terrific um election of Pedro Castillo in Peru, who has officially withdrawn Peru from the Lima group. That's got to yes. be an enormous influence on the on the conversation this week in Mexico. And also this um, this dialogue is happening on the heels of President Lopez Obrador's magnificent discourse on uh, July 24th, the uh, anniversary of Simón Bolívar's birth. Um, and I'll put that discourse in the in the chat for the audience to see. It, it was a it was a profound foreign policy speech um, about the about non interference, the respect of sovereignty, the need to even perhaps get rid of the OAS and create a body that is more inclusive and more respectful of um, national sovereignty and non interference. So yeah. it's a it's a very special moment this week, I think. Yes, and it's also very fluid, you know. Bear in mind that the idea of creating a, a regional body with outside of the OAS framework was a Chavez idea back from 2011. That's when the CELAC was created. So it's a, it's a good that I don't care about credits this, at this moment, you know, it's the, the, the most important thing is to actually do it. And it's also great that Lope Obrador had this idea and has and has been leading it. You know, the tide started to change when he, I think it was early 2020, he said, I'm not for sanctions. San this is not fair and we can't, you know, we, we can't give our back to Venezuela. It's, it, I mean, it's also in Latin America. It, it also goes against their own foreign policy doctrine, their historical one. Even yes. from the pre before neoliberalism, you know? Yes. So in the, in the Herrera doctrine also. And Mexico used to be before this, all the dark years until Lope Obrador got back, got into office, used to be had, had a leading role in all of Latin American affairs. But it was, you know, like it was drawn down because of, well, because of all the, of the, all the neoliberal madness and all the NAFTA framework that. Uh, created that complex and horrible situation that actually, you know, brought Mexico to a very dark place for a long while. So it's it's very important. I even I could have my own difference as Venezuelan as a, and as a Chavista on his Bolivarian conception and his Bolivarian approach and even his hemispheric idea. But it's very. It doesn't mean that it's not clever enough. And it doesn't, and it, it all it perfectly goes into what Mexico always 
uh, represented. And then, yes, you have also the demise. I think it's the demise, or at least it's going to be the, the it's going to take the Lima group to a more frank and candid place because, if, as you well know, the Lima group was actually a Canadian creation. They, they just yes, needed... and it was created to recognize Guaido as the as as the leader of Venezuela. It was one of the reasons it was created to create a block yeah, within it, the OAS. It was well, it was it was a couple of years before. You know, it was in two thousand seventeen, if I'm not mistaken, at the mid two thousand seventeen, with when they after the massive failure of a new regime change, a very violent regime change attempt that didn't work through. And um, it, it did got its strength once uh, and its sense actually when the, and during the Guaido years, you know, as a year and a half afterwards. And, um, but it was a different Latin America back then. And you, and you also had, well, you had Macri, for example, in Argentina, you still got, yeah, who wasn't, you had uh, Peña Nieto in Mexico. Uh, it was a different composition. Well, Peru just, you know, like came out of the, of its sleep after, I don't know, maybe 40 years, 50 years, yes. Velasco yeah. at least. Uh, so it's, that's very, very interesting. And then, but I also say fluid because, well, you know, there's a, also a milder uh, uh, non-Chavista, non-radical, Troika, Troika of tyranny approach from Mexico and Argentina right now, especially with Nicaragua, which, which I think it's pretty unfair. But yeah, I think, but I also say it's fluid because I don't think it have, must be a definitive situation and then and it should evolve at some point. But um, anyway, it's still way more better than just a year ago and even better than two years ago or, two, or three years ago or four years ago when we have a very hostile environment we basically, Venezuela and Cuba and Nicaragua were alone. We were alone for a long time, you know? Even progressive forces, and I have to say this, they didn't do much. They also had like assumed this critical trend because, well, you know, we had to go through tough times and tough decisions also because we were actually not in a political context, we were in a war context, we were in a hybrid warfare context. Yes. The mix of non-conventional war, warfare elements plus a color-coded revolutionary process. Revolutionary in a sense, of course, not, not in, a, in, the, uh, in the ideological way we're used to, but revolutionary in a way, in a very destructive way, you know, in color revolution, which is also, a lab thing. It's not an organic, genuine thing. It's just the you the, using the tactics and using some elements that also you, well. We, we, there's a whole story to this, you know, as well as a whole history to this since then, the end of the 20th century. But um, it just. I think this is important that you brought up since the end of the 20th century, since the since the election of Hugo Chavez as president and and, and the introduction. Uh, I think it's the fifth constitution. Fifth, fifth, fifth republic. constitution, right? Fifth yeah. Republic. Uh, it's very progressive, far more progressive than anything that we live by in the United States. But there has been, you mentioned hybrid war. And for our audience, I'm sure most, uh, mo most of you know, but we're talking about diplomatic warfare, you know, restricting visas, restricting who can apply for passports, who can, who can come to the UN. Uh, sanctions or well sanctions illegal uh, illegal sanctions which which we formally call unilateral coercive measures mm -hmm. and um and also i would argue since 1999 a really a really aggressive media war against the elected venezuelan government yes indeed so there indeed. and so Oh, there, I mean, th those are three forms of hybrid war. There's others as well, but really, the the, the media narrative has been has been profound for for over twenty years. Well, we we had the first media coup in the twentieth century, in the twenty first century. You know, they actually a uh, strict by the book media coup in two thousand two. It yes. was basically based on narratives. Of course, of course, there was a a, a, a hardcore on the ground situation, but what, but it was driven by the narrative. It was driven by media, you know? 
And it was actually a template for a lot of things that came afterwards because even the use of uh, sharpshooters, for example, it's something they used afterwards in Maidan, you know, to create Maidan in Ukraine in 2014, to create confusion and to also fire to both sides. The, the, the one that was against the government and the one that was for the government. And that actually triggered the whole, uh, the final stage of regime change. That was also tested in Venezuela back then, you know, 10 years before, 12 years before. And um, this was April of 2002. This was uh, the uh, coup against um, Hugo Chavez, just for reference for our audience. Yes, it was a, a 47 hour coup, basically. It was from the, from the from April 11th to April the 13th. It was, most importantly, was a counter coup because it was a massive nationwide mobilization, but especially in Caracas, it brought back, I mean, it, it brought down the, the fake, the coup government, and it brought back uh, the elected Commandant government. Chavez. Yes, the elected government, Commandante Chavez uh, into office one more time. And actually that was one of the first radicalizing experiences that made the Bolivarian revolution go further. And it was actually the, the, like the setting stage for what came afterwards. So after those years, uh, we're talking about 2002, 2003, we got the missions starting, the social missions about you know the, the reading pro, the literacy program and, and education programs, which was also a game changer and also the health programs, Barrio, the Mission Barrio Adentro. And then uh, in 2006, Six Chavez got like one of the highest rates of of electoral vote, and right afterwards, it, 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 but right after that, I mean, it started to unleash. And well, you also have Mar del Plata in 2005 when they say when they say Alca Al Carajo, which was the free trade agreement with with Latin America with the Americas. That was also a game changer because not even Nebo was in power then; only Chavez and Lula. And I, I think Nestor Kirchner, yes, and Kirchner from Argentina. And that, you know, started, set the pace for the next, the wave that the, you guys call the pink tide. Yes. It was, and that was actually what was rolled back like 10 years afterwards. And it would, of course, it would use, it used all this technology and it also was focused on all the weaknesses we had here in Venezuela, also in Ecuador, Brazil, Argentina and everywhere else to start to undermine that all the, the reconquered uh, from the people, all the, all the things that were, you know, recovered and all the dignity that was recovered for in, in a lot of places in, in, in a huge swathe of geography. And that was also what was targeted. Yes. But we're seeing such a, a, a potential, I shouldn't even say potential, like I believe we're seeing the reemergence or the resurgence of, I think of, so. of the pink tide. And I think this is the moment that the Mexican government is grasping and yeah. in, in agreeing to host uh, the, the dialogue this week. I also, um, for me, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of the things that I interpret from the opposition that's choosing to participate, mm -hmm. that participates in the Venezuelan political process that does believe in the constitution and in meeting with some of them in December, but also seeing the response, it's and how they've responded or evolved over the years. You know, you brought up the 2002 coup against um, President Chavez. Those events, those external events orchestrated overtly and sometimes less overtly by the United States, really, and not just in Venezuela, but mm -hmm. in most countries throughout the region, have, to me, backfired. They've created, instead of causing massive chaos and disruption within a country, they've created a sense of national sovereignty first. And I feel when you're on the streets in, in Venezuela, you can really feel that people are Venezuelan first. They believe in their country. They are united in preserving themselves as the Venezuelan people. They are, you, I say they, but you are Venezuelan yourself. Um, there's a sense that, and this includes the opposition, not the Guaido opposition, but mm -hmm. we want to be left alone to run our country ourselves. <laughs> 
solve our own problems, initiate our own programs. And we want to do that without external interference. And it's a really strong feeling. In most countries that I have been in the Americas where there's been overt attempts by the United States and or its allies to change a government, all it's done is created a stronger sense of national sovereignty. And I think that sense of national sovereignty is what's hopefully going to play out this week in Mexico City. You see, you can even, I think there are three elements that are pretty important. One of them, of course, is in the case of Venezuela, of course, is they lost. And that's important. That's very important. They lost and they're losers, they're political losers, and they also, uh, they let down their own people. So you have that sort of grievance from a, from, from, a, from a section that was actually radicalized with the opposition with the, with the, with the recent events. Then you have another element, which is also important, which is experience. And I'm not thinking exactly about Venezuela because Venezuela, I think it's uh, because holding the line was tough and it, hurt, and it has been hurting a lot as it has been hurting people and in other places like Ecuador and some other places where, they, where it also hurt a lot to lose what they actually, when they realized what they lost, in all the conquests they got. So then they realize also even people that maybe are not militant or they're not uh, political activists, they know they were better with these independent governments. So it's also a matter of common sense. And then you have a third element, which I think it's very important. And it's not usually brought to the table as it should, I guess, which is nationalism you have latin american nationalism you know which is also feeling that goes even beyond in the case of venezuela it goes beyond chavismo there were several polls about the u.s involvement in changing things in venezuela they always had a high rate of of uh, rejection they could have i mean maybe they didn't like the chavista government maybe they didn't, didn't like nicolas maduro maybe they thought chavez was better or whatever but they believe, and I'm thinking about people that are not necessarily Chavista, they believe that our problems need to be solved uh, by ourselves. And that's a very important element. That's something they also woke up in the people because when you push someone too hard to some very hard place, they're, they're sooner or later they're going to react in a good way because you're gonna realize what it's actually at stake. And so you have to also, you have to get, give credit to that uh, line of thinking that not one more time, it, it, it's predominant and it doesn't necessarily involve Chavismo, but then you have the stubborn majority of Chavismo as uh, hugely mobilized. I mean, we had the, the, the primaries last Sunday in the 88th and it was five million people voting terry to wow. pick their candidates for regional elections and even they got uh, even people that are not uh, in the party they don't have a party uh, card that also participated and voted they were open five million people you know in this crappy context. So that tells you a lot of how people still engage in politics and believe in political solutions on a local level. We're talking about local politics here, which always is a bit different, but of course they're interconnected, but of course there are also different priorities for different people because if maybe in Caracas it's, very, it's much more easier to see the, the global interaction but when you're in some, you know, any other place in, in, in inside Venezuela, it's not that obvious. It's not that obvious at a first stick. Of course, if you if you dig a dip, a big a, a bit deeper, you're gonna find it. But that tells you how vibrant and and lively politics are, and how people believe that they have something to do and to say if they vote and if they participate. It's really, um, it's, it's really a wonderful thing to see, especially as you mentioned earlier, how, um, how difficult 
um, U.S. interventionism in all its forms in Venezuela has made daily life, and yet people still participate. Um, they still navigate their day, and I and I can tell the audience with personal experience. I've lived in Venezuela for three, four month periods at a time. It's not easy uh, living under universal coercive measures to navigate what what people in the states would call a normal day, and yet exactly. all of you do it. You do it because you believe in yourselves and your country and your sovereignty. And it's a very, very powerful thing to, to be among. It's, it's very powerful to be among you and your people. What would, in our um, closing minutes, Diego, what would you, as a Venezuelan citizen, what, what's your dream vision for this week in Mexico City? Well, you know, you said something that I think you can also sum up as a battle for normalcy, you know, to have a normal life, a normal daily life. And if this is going to contribute to exactly that, to have a livable life, a, a bit better than we have now, uh, with, li uh, with uh, an economy that could actually work, and with people not trying to disrupt the natural process of, you know, just reaching out to each other in a normal way and to find solutions, that's, that would be huge because it's gonna be complex and challenging. That's also something that President Nicolás have said, and I believe him, boy, do I believe him. And um, you know, and what I, also it's, a, I think it's a fear also, because I remember, for example, when the Comandante Chavez died in 2013, it was like a natural process to, you know, build bridges up among people. It was actually the opposition was uh, the opposition people with opposition thought were actually more scared than we were. Uh, it was a natural process just to reach normally to all these people. And then suddenly in February 2014, we have like this awful pact, this dark pact within Le between Leopoldo Lopez, Maria Corina Machado and Antonio Ledesma, called La Salida, the exit, which actually targeted that feeling, that national feeling of just, you know, talk, you know, to keep the dialogue going between people that have lots of difference, but don't care about uh, at the end of the day, because we all share the same need to have a nice and decent life and to have, you know, and, and to make the, your, the value of your work worth, to have a decent salary, to be able to have, to make, to, to, to have one more time the, the, the security you had with, uh, with healthcare, for example, or with education and not living in, in this kind of uncertainty. So if this is gonna cast out those ghosts, it's gonna be just a major, major step and it should be taken. Well, it's very hopeful, and as and as we said earlier, the 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 com, uh, complexion of Latin America is different now than yes. than the last uh, go rounds with the dialogue between uh, the Maduro government and the opposition, and it's um, I feel it's really hopeful for yeah, all of you, I, and I, I hope I, that's I, not I, naive because I'm sitting here outside your country. But I I just feel the moment is so is so hopeful. And well, you know, to, to have a possibility. Yeah. Just yes. to have a, a real possibility. Yeah. Exactly. With That's support true. from so many others throughout the region as well. I mean, the, exactly. the, the, the complexion of countries, as you said, you know, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, for many years, the three of you were alone and you now are, um, have more <laughs> compatriots with you now. And, uh, exactly. and, I, and I think the president of Mexico has really seized that moment. I, I do believe, and I hope he I hope he keeps moving forward and delivering with that. Yes. So, so I will keep our fingers crossed. We'll keep watching yes. how the dialogue moves forward this week, and I hope you come back and um, and we can analyze what uh, when the when the dialogues are complete, we can talk about sure. um, how they went. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It'll, it'll be soon enough there, so don't worry. It, Wonderful. It'll happen.
Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to remind um, our audience that you've been watching What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program. We broadcast on Code Pink's YouTube channel every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. And don't forget to catch Code Pink radio every Thursday at 11.30, oh, excuse me, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific on WBAI out of New York City and WPFW out of Washington, D.C. Again, thanks a lot, Diego. Wonderful Thank conversation. You. So happy to see you again. Yes, me too. All the best. Thank you so much.